Elon Musk is set to take control of Twitter. It's one of the biggest tech acquisitions of all time. So what will it mean for the future of this popular platform and for freedom of speech? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. Free speech is the bedrock of a functioning democracy and Twitter is its digital town square. These are the words of the world's richest man and now the owner of that town square. Elon Musk sealed the deal for $44 billion. Twitter's board unanimously agreed to sell to the man promising to promote free speech and transparency. But the future of the company is not yet clear. Twitter has been losing value over the past year, and Musk is notorious for trying to silence his critics. The social media takeover sparked this reaction from the White House. What I can tell you as a general matter, no matter who owns or runs uh, Twitter, uh, the president has long been concerned about the power of large social media platforms, uh, what they the power they have over our everyday lives, has long argued that tech platforms must be held accountable for the harms they cause. Uh, he has been a strong supporter of fundamental re reforms to achieve that goal, including reforms to Section 230, enacting antitrust reforms, requiring more transparency, and more. And he's encouraged uh, that uh, there's bipartisan interest in Congress. Uh, in terms of what hypothetical policies uh, might uh, happen, I'm just not going to speak to that. Well, after the purchase, Elon Musk tweeted, yes, and said, I want to make Twitter better than ever by enhancing the product with new features, making algorithms open source to increase trust, defeating the spam bots and authenticating all humans. Twitter has tremendous potential, he said. I look forward to working with the company and the community of users to unlock it. Well, the move has sparked plenty of reaction, both good and bad. Here's what some people in New York had to say. I just don't think it would be good if he had all that control. And just because he has a lot of money doesn't give him all that power. I think he'll turn it for the better. How so? Uh, giving people more freedom of speech. Maybe bringing my man Trump back to Twitter. I don't think that the one person should have full control of the platform. I think the people should have their own voice and be able to share how they feel. He wants to buy it or whatever and make it a private company, but it's like, you already got so much money, you already got so much stuff. Why are you messing with Twitter, bro? Like, I'm on Twitter all the time, but it's like, why are you go over here buying Twitter, like, stunting on this, you know? Well, even if you don't have a Twitter account, it is unlikely that you've not heard of it. It's been around for 16 years. It's a platform based in the US for microblogging and social networking services. It's estimated to have more than 436 million registered users who post and interact using short messages known as tweets. These users are regular people like you and me, also celebrities, organizations and governments who use Twitter to reach millions of people. Elon Musk is an avid tweeter with an audience of more than 80 million followers himself. In 2020, Twitter's annual revenue reached 3.72 billion US dollars. It's a relatively small amount compared to other giants like Facebook that made more than $84 billion that same year. Let's bring in our guests now and joining us from London, we have Quinn McHugh, Executive Director at Article 19. From Los Angeles, we have Ramesh Srinivasan, Professor of Information Studies at the University of California. And also from London, Charles Arthur, a journalist specialising in technology and social media. A very warm welcome to all of you. Quinn, let's start with you. Why has Twitter accepted Elon Musk's offer when just a few days ago the board unanimously agreed not to let the takeover go through? Well, I think maybe some of uh, people who are more inclined on the business press can speak to that. Maybe Charles can speak to that relatively well. But it's clear that the offer that was ultimately made um, exceeded the share price of Twitter at the present rate, such mm. that it was a very attractive bid, even after they, the Twitter board had put in a poison pill notoriously just last week on any kind of attempts at takeover. Charles, do you agree with that? Was this an offer that was simply too good for Twitter to refuse in the end? 
Well, it's interesting that Twitter was due to report its first quarter results this Thursday, and it's not now going to do this. So uh, some people feel that with the general slowdown in the world economy, that maybe things weren't looking so good. And actually, this was the best offer actually on the table. It was easy for them to refuse the offer initially because Musk didn't have the financing. Mm. Then they were hoping that maybe someone else might turn up and uh, have more money. I mean, it's less than the share price was, the $55 that Musk is offering is less than the share price was uh, last year when it was around about $80, but it's more than it has been. So it's the sort of thing where it was the best offer around and possibly they didn't see things improving. So yes, it's it's pretty obvious in that respect why they took it. Okay. You know, take money, you know, better have the burden in the hand. Uh, Ramesh, it is a lot of money for a business that's been described as woefully unprofitable. Why did Elon, why does Elon Musk want it? Oh, well, first of all, Elon Musk loves to get into little, you know, battles and turf wars and little, you know, sort of arm wrestling matches mm. on Twitter. He really enjoys uh, being active on Twitter. And I also think that it fits within Elon Musk's uh, ideological portfolio, if you will, right? We see him owning multiple other types of companies. And he's always kind of been this person who likes to be a little bit outlandish in his sort of claims for free speech. And so now he owns a social media wing to his media conglomerate empire. And so for him, it's a major achievement. Um, and Twitter, despite not necessarily being profitable, remains extremely influential, especially on media itself, right? Reporters all around the world often source and engage with stories via Twitter. Ramesh, given that Twitter is so influential in society, is it right that such a powerful tool should be in the hands of just one man? I think it's extremely problematic, actually, not for many, many different reasons. Um, first of all, Twitter was already encountering huge issues with algorithmically powered disinformation. What I mean by that is content was being targeted to people and going viral that tended to be hateful, conspiratorial, and really kind of grabbing of people's attention. So that's not the way any sort of media network should function. There should be some baseline of kind of commonality to what people see. Um, it's really problematic even more so because Musk himself has boasted uh, quite widely that he's a free speech absolutist, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That means in any given society, um, when we talk about free speech, we should have lots of different kinds of speech be part of the platform. But what we found again and again on Twitter, and Musk is highly unlikely to do anything about it, is that hateful speech or speech that is intended to grab your attention is the content that ends up going viral again and again. So. Uh, Musk, who has been always against regulation of almost any kind um, and calls himself a free, free speech absolutist as a private, you know, wealthy, hyper wealthy person, wealthiest person in the world. This this recipe is a concoction for even greater problems with big tech's uh, takeover of all of our lives around the world. And I want to do everything we can to sort of rein this in and balance the playing fields a little bit more. Mm. Just as a small aside, Ramesh, why is that hate speech so popular on people's news feeds? That's a great question. So the reason why is what is happening with all technology platforms is data is constantly being gathered about hundreds, you know, of, of the hundreds of billions of people, hundreds of millions of people, excuse me, all around the world. So data around what we look at, how long we look at it, what we tweet, what we comment on, et cetera. This is all fine-grained behavioral data. So based on the data that's being captured about us all the time, without us really even being aware of it, content is being suggested based on prediction, mm. all based on correlation, prediction of what will capture our attention. So the business model of the technology platform is to keep us all locked in there all the time. And one thing that gets all of our attention, no matter who we are, is crazy or outrageous content. So unless that is fundamentally intervened with, and Musk has given no uh, signals that that's something he really ultimately cares about, which is an instrument of democracy, some baseline of common understanding, uh, then our problems continue. But Quinn, how much could that be countered by making the algorithms open source, exposing them so that people have more control over what they see? Because that is also something that Musk has said he wants to do. 
I think we need to be clear what we're, we're talking about when we talk about algorithmic mm. transparency, which is something our, our organization has called for and numerous other people have as well. There's the, the transparency of what the algorithm is itself, um, but then there's also transparency in terms of how it actually operates. Just having the code out there doesn't necessarily tell you about the little tweaks and various things that are going on. So one way of making companies more accessible is making more of the code out there for people to look at, to evaluate, and otherwise. But as, as Ramesh was saying, the fundamental problem is the attention economy. And that is what drives the business model of this company and much more successful companies than Twitter, if you look at Facebook and YouTube. And it's that the fundamental business model that centralizes control over what we see and what we do and what we interact with in a few small, powerful companies' hands. So Charles, is what Elon Musk is wanting to do with Twitter, is it realistic? I mean, he's given very few details, no details on how he proposes to reduce censorship. We don't even know if he can sort of expose this algorithm. How would that work? Is this something that he's actually going to see happen? What he said has been quite contradictory. He's talked about things like getting rid of bots, but at the same time uh, being a free speech absolutist. But bots are a form of free speech, so where's the line there? Similarly, you know, are you going to allow terrorist videos? Are you going to allow child sexual abuse material? Obviously not. Um, so your free speech absolutism clearly has a line. And the question is, where does he draw the line? And uh, I, I think that's the, the complicated part that, that, you know, it's very easy to talk about these things at conferences, but actually when you're running the company, it becomes a different question. I think that the, the point that Ramesh and Quinn have both made about the algorithm is, is interesting. Actually, uh, if you were to remove the algorithm that amplifies content, that amplifies outrage, which is the thing that we pay attention to, then you have a sort of a, a stripped back at Twitter, one which is much more just about what people are saying rather than things being thrust at you to gain your interest because that's what gets advertising in front of you. And if Twitter doesn't necessarily have to survive on advertising, then it might be able to take on a different sort of character. But he's given no clues about that. He's made fake noises about subscriptions. But mm. if he was to change the character of Twitter that way, that, that could actually have a big impact both on the dis disinformation and on the attention economy, as but, Quinn described it. But do you think people will still want to use it? I mean, you know, as human beings, we do tend to be drawn towards this sort of dramatic speech. If that's not there, if it doesn't exist, what's the point in using it? We want to be entertained, don't we, well, pers essentially? <laughs> Personally, I never see any Twitter ads and I don't get the algorithmic uh, Twitter feed because I use a third party app called Tweetbot and uh, it only gets the sort of chronological timeline and no ads. So in that sense, I'm getting you know the Twitter that, mm. that uh, it used to be and most possibly it could be. So you know this is totally possible and I use it all the time because I'm a journalist and mm. as Ramesh said, you know, journalists are drawn to it because that's where you find news really quickly or you find sources, you find information. Quinn, he has said that he would allow the laws of each individual country to govern the free speech or, 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 de or de determine what free speech is allowed. But how does that work when Twitter is a global entity and there are so many different countries with so many different laws? Well, I think you've zeroed in on something that's going to be a, a fundamental problem to the idea of um, really enforcing what we consider the global international norms on freedom of expression which is at present time, um, according to our own research, freedom of expression globally is at its lowest level in 20 years. And this is increasingly driven by laws passed at the national level that restrict significantly and severely what global media companies like Twitter, Facebook and others are allowed to do, or that gives company or gives governments huge control over the kind of content, whether it's through data localization laws requiring companies to hold data on all of their users in a country, within the country, whether it's things like landing laws. So for example, requiring companies to have local offices in countries, which then gives governments a form of pressure mm. and influence over what's being done because staff can be held hostage. So the global picture becomes much more complex when you take into account the different laws and the fact that actually democracy is at its lowest ebb in 20 to 30 years. That means it's incredibly complex to find places where 
that view of freedom of expression is as supported as he may think it is. Ramesh, we, we heard there from the White House that Biden is concerned about such concentrations of power in social media companies. That was the extent that the, they went to. They didn't comment specifically on this case. But what can governments do about it? I mean, how can they police this sort of takeover, even if they wanted to? Right. And I think what we're headed to potentially and very problematically will be this false choice between a free speech absolutist, a private hyper wealthy guy who basically kind of says, let 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 the wildfires uh, go. Mm. And the backlash is going to be a censorship kind of model by a lot of restrictive and sort of authoritative governments and states. And and this is going to end up being an, a really problematic flashpoint because the real issue should be governing these platforms, not so not solely in their private accumulative profit and valuation driven interest, but in a democratic interest. Right. And so here in the United States, I have several colleagues uh, connected to the administration and also people I work with in Congress. And there is widespread dissatisfaction with the status quo, but we have seen very little in terms of actual action either taken by the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Communications Commission, or on a congressional level, despite this widespread kind of discontent. And I think the reason why is because the biggest lobbyists um, in Democratic administrations and to some extent in Republican administrations, despite sort of high profile, you know, flashpoints like little controversies, uh, are the big tech companies. We should no longer think about big technology companies as simply social media or simply technology companies. Uh, they're the wealthiest and most powerful companies in the history of the world. When our military budget gets expanded under the Biden administration to record levels, many of those contracts go to technology companies, right? So they've taken over every aspect of our lives by monetizing our attention, by grabbing our data, and by basically taking our anxieties and emotions as their raw materials for a new, expansive, immersive form of digital capitalism. So we need to think about what people need in their actual interests, right? What a real free speech looks like in balance with a free media, mm. right? We really need to think about those issues so people can be uplifted along with these companies as well. Charles, how concerning do you find it that all of that power that Ramesh has just been talking about, at least in Twitter's uh, concern, is now in the hands of one man? Well, I mean, social media in the, in the form of Facebook is in effect in mm -hmm. the hands of Mark Zuckerberg. Google uh, is effectively held by uh, Sergey Brin and uh, Larry Page because they have all the voting stock. So, yeah, we're very much in a situation where you have an incredible concentration of power. Um, and the US Congress, because of course they're American companies, struggles to find ways to regulate these companies because it's not quite sure what it is that it wants them to do or not do. It wants mm. them not to be bad, but it doesn't know quite how to do that without um, tripping all over the First Amendment, which of course stops the US government from uh, impeding what companies can say and in fact what citizens can say. There's possibly more movement on that in Europe because of the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act, which may have some sort of leverage over these companies. Um, but that remains to be seen. I think that'll start to become a bit clearer in the next couple of years. But again, the, the, the question becomes one of, well, if, they, if the companies withdraw their services and they say, well, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to show up in France, Germany, Italy, wherever, do the governments cave in because the citizens demand the services or do other services spring up? It's difficult to say. Mm. And let's not forget, of course, that governments use these services themselves. I mean, governments use Twitter to release their policies. I mean, let's not forget that Trump was hugely successful, largely on the back of his tweets. We were reporting them all the time at 3 a.m. here at Al Jazeera. Uh, what chance do you think um, Trump might get his account back? Well, I think... Considering that Elon Musk himself has talked about restoring the account, I think it, it's a fairly significant likelihood. And while I may be living in Britain right now, I do remember the very problematic days of, as you yourself said, recording constantly the tweets mm. coming from Donald Trump. And at the very moment when it's being found that there was a significant um, insurrection planned, an attempt to overthrow the US election orchestrated by Donald Trump, I think we need to take seriously that that's a real risk politically and for democracy in the United States and not just be viewed at a free speech lens. One of the one of the, the powers of freedom of expression is leveling 
between the powerful and the powerless. And one of the things that we're concerned with because of Elon Musk's own experiences is that he's actually more concerned about ensuring that those who are already powerful don't find their voices constrained mm. when actually the attention should be placed on those who are not in positions of power and ensuring they're not driven off platforms or that they have the same kind of access as those who our billionaires have. But if people do want to leave Twitter, they can. Do you think we will see a lot of people leaving the platform, Quinn? It's, it's very difficult to say. Um, one of the things I think we need to take in, into account is globally, Twitter actually is not one of the largest tech companies. Twitter has an audience of about 430, 440 million, as, as you said. Um, you know, just taking into account apps that are just strictly messenger apps, like WhatsApp, mm. that has over 2 billion users. Telegram, um, a much smaller one, has 550 million. We put a lot of emphasis on Twitter because it is really important for the media and therefore content on Twitter gets amplified and crosses over into the mainstream media a lot more. But never leave the potential for innovation um, to the side. I think Charles mentions that maybe if these platforms are constrained, other services will jump up to, to take their place. Um, on a problematic side, we've already seen this happen in China where the large Western social media companies are effectively banned or mm. outright banned. And yet there's a very vibrant, um, but yet very censored social media um, environment that's there. So I do think that if somehow Twitter does disappear or becomes a less hospitable place for people to be, that there will be alternatives that arise. Charles, can Musk walk this tightrope of courting new leaders, but also uh, users, but also stopping defectors? Well, you know, many things are possible, and it has to be said that you know he he has had successes with uh, building you know, an electric vehicle company at mm -hmm. Tesla, building reusable space rockets with SpaceX, and uh, this is a this is a different game because this is dealing with humans and the very very way that humans behave. I mean, it, it can be done. I mean, we haven't mentioned the financials of this yet, which which are tricky because he needs at least a billion dollars a year to repay just the interest on his debts. Mm. Twitter has never come close to generating that sort of money. So he's going to have to find some sort of new business model for it, really, in order to make it thrive. And everyone agrees that Twitter has enormous value, but they can't quite see how to unlock it. Advertising clearly isn't the way to do it. But you know, if, if he was to make it a sort of a, a backbone almost a communications backbone for the world, then you could see that there's uh, enormous value, as you said, you know, to, to world leaders, to people with huge celebrity followings. Uh, why would they not want to uh, pay a certain amount of money in order to be able to make their voices heard? And possibly that's a, a way forward so that you can, in effect, you pay for your free speech. It might sound like a contradiction, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure that he'd be fairly happy with that. Uh, Ramesh, indeed, uh, he says he wants to unlock uh, Twitter's tremendous potential what is that potential, do you think? Well, the potential is for it to be the indisposable and indispensable tool for us all to communicate with one another, you know, much like what basically Facebook slash Meta's portfolio has really taken that over. So I think his real goal would be to unlock Twitter to be the absolute tool that we use to connect with one another and also just sort of learn about the wider world. The problem is, is the wider world as being presented to us is not an open public sphere, right? In any public sphere, there are of course going to be some hateful voices or some people who are saying things that are just not true. The problem is, is on Twitter, much like on Facebook, which have, as you all pointed out, dominates sort of the global South and the global kind of marketplace on a lot of levels, especially if you include Instagram and WhatsApp in their portfolio. Um, the problem is, is that content the content that they are fueling to us again and again and again is the content designed to grab our eyeballs. So they're going to have to explore different kinds of business models that perhaps may be more rooted in a certain kind of humanity, right, in all of our voices. And I do want to make the point, despite the potential challenges in making the funds to pay off this debt, Musk is the wealthiest person in the history of the world. He's made a huge amount of wealth during the pandemic, as have all of the tech, you know, billionaires approaching trillionaires. They've doubled their wealth in many cases. And reinstating uh, the former president onto Twitter will be an incredibly effective uh, success in terms of supporting Musk's interest to grow and build up the platform and have it boom even more. Absolutely. Because the former president was a central node 
on Twitter himself. He was a central node because of his messaging of often outrageous and false content, mm. which went viral all the time. Certainly some interesting times ahead, and we're all going to have to stay on Twitter to see what happens. Many thanks for, for, to you all for joining us today. Quinn McHugh, Ramesh Srinivasan and Charles Arthur. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And yes, we are on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here in Doha, it's goodbye for now.